Okay, the reading for this week is Sakaguchi Ango's Hakuchi, 1946. So published right out the year after the war, after the end of the war. Uh, translation is by George Saito as the idiot. I'm going to read the entire work here. You can listen to it as you read your uh, translation and the original work you have. And you will have a study guide with uh, uh, t- 10 or 15 questions that make you think very deeply about this work. So you can refer to the questions as you uh, read the work. Sakaguchi Ango, of course, was uh, a very important novelist in the early first half of the 20th century. Born in 1906, died in 1955. Uh, Born in Niigata, Sakaguchi was one of a group of young Japanese writers to rise to prominence in the years immediately following Japan's defeat in World War II. In 1946, he wrote his most famous essay titled Darakuron on Decadence, which examined the role of Bushido during the war. Um, the study guide, which you have there, um, has, let's see how many questions, has a total of nine questions. Let me just read the uh, study guide questions before I read the actual story. So you can think, keep these in, in mind as you listen to the story. Study guide question uh, number one, describe the point of view, the focalization point, the tone, the interior monologue, use of interior monologue, and the various literary techniques used, some consciously modernist and experimental. Are there any flashbacks or analepsies, analepsies as we say in the uh, fancy terminology, or any uh, flash forwards, prolepsis? Is the story told chronologically, or does it jump all over the place? What eye novel elements do you detect? Explain. Okay, so this is basically a question about uh, the narration, the narrative style, narrative methods that are used in the story. So these are narratological questions. Um, And you will uh, have learned by now that the difference between uh, point of view and focalization point is very important. Shiten in Japanese versus shoten, focalization point. The point of view or shiten is uh, first person or third person. Focalization point is uh, when in third person uh, works, the third person point of view jumps around uh, in its focus for between various characters. Question number two. Discuss the setting. The people, their environment, their state of living, moral condition, historical circumstances, as described in the first few pages. Is the war the main cause for the people's fallen condition? Remember, daraku, or fallenness, is a very important word in all of Sakaguchi Ango's writings. Is the war to blame for this state of fallenness, or is it something more primordial, or something more original, or uh, innate to the human condition? Uh, Consider that. Why do you think Sakaguchi goes into such detail in these opening pages before the main plot line begins? So there's a very long sort of prelude, uh, prologue, in this work um, that lasts for several pages before it actually jumps in and narrows in on the main characters of the story. Why do you think he includes this uh, prologue? Um, Question number three is, uh, who are the so-called Buraiha Libertine writers? Buraiha uh, is a major group of writers uh, that came to prominence after the war and lasted for a decade or so. Dazai Osama is one of the other ones, Ishika Jun, Sakaguchi Ango, uh, Oda no Sakunosuke are the other ones associated with this group. What are the characteristics of this group? Donald King describes their writings as sometimes farcical and sometimes nihilistic. What is farcical or nihilistic about this story we're reading today? How does the theme of daraku, fallenness, moral or social degradation, civilizational degradation appear in this story. Explain. Okay, so it's a question about the Buraiha and this uh, element of Daraku. It's very important in this work. Question number four. Numerous binary oppositions appear in this work. This is probably the most important um, question, so uh, make your answer for this one longer than the others. And this is a question that I uh, include in many um, of my study guides on works of literature because binaries and dichotomies and polar opposites appear in most works and they're often very, very important and understanding their relation to each other within each uh, binary pair 
is usually a key to understanding the work as a whole. So numerous binary oppositions appear in this work. Make a list of them. So just start, as you read the story, make a list of all the opposites that appear, life, death, and so forth. In each binary, which opposite has a positive valence and which has a negative valence? So maybe purity and impurity is another one that's very important here. So uh, some of the other examples in this work are uh, the individual versus the herd. Right? The individual is given prominence or given a positive valence in Sakaguchi's writings. Uh, he's sort of an individualistic writer. Versus the negative, the herd. Another one is niktai, or flesh, the body. Niktai is positive. Versus the negative, koktai, which is the body of the nation, which is, has a nev negative valence in this work. And uh, many of his works written around this period uh, are very critical of the koktai and of the imperial and, uh, ideology and nationalism and so forth. Um, also, animal versus human. Animal takes precedence over the human in this story, right? So you have, that's another dichotomy, but there are many, many more. Make a list of all these dichotomies and decide which one is given uh, positive value in the work. Question number five. Sakaguchi Ango studied Eastern and Indian philosophy while an undergraduate at Toyo University in the 1920s. So Buddhist elements, Buddhist ideas frequently appear in his works. Can you identify any such elements in this work? Explain. Okay, so some hints are uh, nothingness. And we also read his story, uh, Mankai no Shita no Nantoka. I forget the original Japanese title, but um, I forget the original the, uh, English translation as well, but Under the Cherry Blossoms in Full Bloom or something like that, which is a short story they wrote around the same time that also has these Buddhist ideas or Buddhist elements of nothingness and the emptiness and the absolute solitude and attachment and so forth in the work. So they also appear here, explain their uh, significance and function in this work. Nothingness, emptiness, absolute solitude, attachment, shu chaku, and so forth. Question number six. Discuss Izawa. The, the main character, the protagonist of the work, describe his job, worldview, view of his self, view of others, circumstances, daily concerns, his view about art, his attitudes toward the war, toward the woman that comes to live with him, the hakchi, the idiot woman, etc. And question number seven is discuss the woman, the other major characters in, character in this work. The feeble-minded feeble woman is one way to translate hakchi. Uh, what metaphors, similes are used to describe her? Is she a symbol for something? If so, what? Okay, so she's given, I think, symbolic valence in this story, um, mainly because she's not really a full uh, round character, we might say, um, is a term that we might want to use, round and flat character. Obviously, she has no interiority, very little uh, personality, because she's an idiot woman who doesn't really speak much. So she, uh, instead of being a normal, full uh, fledged character. She's sort of a symbol for something. I think it's safe to say. What is she a symbol for is basically that question. Number eight, Sakaguchi's description of the 1945 Tokyo fire bombings is one of the best descriptions of urban aerial bombardment, bombardment in all modern literature. Donald Keane has said there are few comparable accounts of what it meant both physically and spiritually to live through the bombings of Tokyo in 1945. That's in Keen, 1999, his 1999 book on page 1078. I think it's um, Dawn to the West. Uh, so he hails this description of the firebombing of Tokyo as one of the best literary descriptions, representations of the actual historical event. Discuss the firebombing scene in the story, discuss its effects, and discuss Izawa's response to it. What literary techniques are used to convey the experience? Question number nine, discuss the ending. This is the last question on your study guide. Discuss the ending, which is very significant in this work. Why does Sakaguchi refer to the destructiveness of war as a gigantic love, which would pass impartial judgment upon everything? So it seems like he's praising this awful event of the firebombing of Tokyo in March on March 10th, 1945, which famously uh, killed over 100,000 citizens of Tokyo that one night, uh, he seems to be celebrating the event in a kind of weird, sardonic, nihilistic way. What do you think will happen to Izawa and the woman after the war ends? Will they continue their uh, kind of strange relationship with each other, or will she go off and um, he be left alone? 
again, write a short sequel to the story, just a, a paragraph or two uh, summarizing what you think happens after the events told in this work. All right, now we are going to jump into the story. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's about 25 pages in the English translation here. It might take a while, but uh, bear with me. The Idiot, Sakuguchi Ango. And I've already introduced him, I think. Novelist, born in 1906, died in 1955. His famous essay titled Daraku Rong, or On Daraku, on Decadence, examined the role of Bushido during the war. Okay, here's the story now. Various species lived in the house. Human beings, a pig, a dog, a hen, a duck. But actually, there was hardly any difference in their style of lodging or in the food they ate. So from the very beginning, we have this kind of, the line between human and animal is blurred, right? They're kind of all in a similar state. Um, it was a crooked building like a storehouse. The owner and his wife lived on the ground floor, while a mother and her daughter rented the attic. The daughter was pregnant, but no one knew who was responsible. So already we, we see this state of daraku, the state of decadence that the humans are, have fallen into from this first paragraph. The room that Izawa, so the main character of the story, Izawa is introduced here, underline uh, his name here so you remember it. The room that Izawa rented was in a hut detached from the main house. It had formerly been occupied by a family's consumptive son who had died. So sickness, right? He's got kekkaku. Uh, TB. Uh, for, even if it had been assigned to a consumptive pig, the hut could hardly have been considered extravagant. Nevertheless, it had drawers, shelves, and a lavatory. The owner and his wife were tailors. They also gave sewing lessons to the neighbors, and this was the reason that the son had been placed in a set, separate hut. The owner was an official of the neighborhood association, in which the girl who lived in the attic had originally worked. It appeared that while she was living in the association's office, she had enjoyed sexual relations indiscriminately with all the officers of the association except the president and the tailor. She had thus had more than ten lovers, and now she was with child by one of them. When this unfortunate fact became known, the officials collected a fund to take care of the child when it was born. In this world, nothing goes to waste. Among the officials was a bean curd dealer who continued to visit the girl even after she had become pregnant and taken refuge in the attic. In the end, the girl was virtually established as this man's mistress. When the other officials learned of the situation, they immediately withdrew their contributions and asserted that the bean curd dealer ought to bear their, her living expenses. There were seven or eight of them who refused to pay including the greengrocer, the watchmaker, and the landlord. Since they had been given five yen each, the, co the loss was considerable and there was no end to the girl's resentment. She had a big mouth and two large eyes, yet she was fearfully thin. She disliked the duck and tried to give all the leftovers to the hen, but since the duck invariably butted in and snatched the food, she would chase it furiously around the room. The way she ran in a strangely erect pose with her huge belly and her buttocks jutting out from the f out to the front and the rear bore a striking resemblance to the duck's waddle. So again, this line between human and animals is uh, blurred. At the entrance to the alley was a tobacconist, a thickly powdered woman of 55. She had just got rid of her seventh or eighth lover, and rumor had it that she was now having trouble making up her mind about whether to choose in his stead a middle-aged Buddhist priest or a certain shopkeeper, also middle-aged. She was known to sell a couple of cigarettes at the black market price to any young man who went to the back door of her shop. Why don't you try to bind some, sir? The tailor suggested to Izawa. Izawa, however, had no need to call on the woman since he received a special ration at his office ration at his office. Behind the rice supply office, diagonally opposite the tobacconists, lived a widow who had accumulated some savings. She had two children, a son, who was a factory hand, and a younger daughter. Though really brother and sister, these two had lived as man and wife. The widow had connived at this, feeling that it would be cheaper in the long run. In the meantime, however, the son had acquired a mistress on the side. 
The need had therefore arisen to marry off the daughter, and it had been decided that she should become the bride of a man of fifty or sixty who was vaguely related. Thereupon the daughter had taken rat poison. After swallowing the poison, she had come to the tailor's, where Izawa lodged, for her sewing lesson. There she had begun to suffer the most atrocious agonies and had finally died. The local doctor certified that she had died from a heart attack and that this had been the end of the matter. Eh? Izawa had asked the tailor in surprise. Where do you find doctors who will issue such convenient certificates? The tailor had even had been even more surprised. You mean to say they don't do that sort of thing everywhere, he said? It was a neighborhood where tenements were clustered together. A considerable proportion of the rooms were occupied by kept women or prostitutes. Since these women had no children, and since they were all inclined to their rooms neat, they were inclined, inclined to keep their rooms neat, the characters, caretakers, caretakers of the buildings liked having them as tenants and did not mind about the disorderliness and immorality of their private lives. More than half of the apartments had become dormitories used by munition factories and were occupied by groups of women volunteer workers. Among the tenants were pregnant volunteers who continued receiving their salaries even though they never went to work, the girlfriend of Mr. So-and-so in such-and-such a section of the government, the wartime wife of the section chief, which meant that the real life wife had been evacuated from Tokyo, the official mistress of a company director. One of the women was reported to be a 500 yen mistress and was the object of general envy. Next door to the soldier of fortune from Manchuria, who proudly boasted that his profession had to be murder, his younger sister studied sewing with the tailor, his profession used to be murder, lived a manual therapist. Next to him lived a man who, it was rumored, belonged to one of the traditional schools that practiced the fine art of picking pockets. Behind him lived a naval sub-lieutenant who ate fish, drank coffee, feasted on tinned food, and had sake every night. Because of the subterranean water which one found on digging a foot or so below the surface, it was almost impossible to construct air raid shelters in this neighborhood. The sub-lieutenant, however, had someone contrived to build had somehow contrived to build a concrete shelter which was even finer than his actual apartment. So this is the first mention of the, uh, the first foreshadowing of the uh, air raids that are about to come in the final scene of the story. The department store, a wooden two-story building on the route that Izawa on his way to work, Izawa took on his way to work, was closed because of the wartime lack of commodities, but on the upper floor, gambling was being carried on every day. The boss of the gambling gang also controlled a number of people's bars. He got dead drunk every day of the week and used to glare fiercely at the people who stood in queues waiting to enter the, his bars. On graduating from university, Izawa became, had become a newspaper reporter. There's a note there. We can probably erase that from our text. Subsequently, he had started working on educational films. This was his, and educational films, of course, means propaganda films, because this is during the uh, final years of the war. Uh, so he started working on propaganda educational films. This was his present job, but he was still an apprentice and had not yet directed anything independently. He was 27. Okay, so here we get some information about Izawa. And keep in mind that uh, the narrator, the uh, point of view, of course, is third person, focused. The focalization point is mainly on Izawa. However, we will see that it jumps to the female character at some points in the story. So let's keep our eyes uh, trained on the focalization point and its uh, shifting movements. He was 27, an age at which, no, at which one is likely to know something about the seamy side of society. And in fact, he had managed to pick up a good deal of inside information about politicians, army officers, businessmen, geisha, and entertainers. Yet he had never managed to imagine that life in the suburban shopping district surrounded by small factories and apartment buildings could be anything like this. 
It occurred to him that it might be due to the roughening effect of the war on people's characters, but when he asked the tailor about it one day, the man replied in a quiet, philosophical way, No, to tell the truth, things haven't always been like this in our neighborhood. Okay. That uh, relates to that question I had on the study guide. Are things as they are right now due to the war and the conditions brought about by the war? Or are these uh, this, this state that humanity is in in the story, is it more of a universal condition that uh, man is sort of doomed to in all epochs? But the outstanding character of them all, the most... I should say, most outstanding character. But the most outstanding character of them all was the man next door. This neighbor was mad. He was quite well off, and one way in which his madness revealed itself was in an excessive fear of intrusion by burglars or other in undesirable people. This had led him to choose for his house a place at the very end of the alley and to construct the entrance in, which, in such a way that one could not find it even if one went up to the house and passed the gate. There was nothing to be seen from the front but a latticed window. The real entrance was at the opposite end of the house from the gate and one had to go around the entire building to reach it. The owner's plan was that an intruder would either give up and beat a hasty retreat, or else would be discovered as he roamed about the house looking for the elusive entrance. Izawa's mad neighbor had little liking for the common people of this floating world. His house was a two-story building with quite a large number of rooms, but even the well-informed tailor knew hardly anything about the interior design. The madman was about 30. He had a wife of about 25 and a mother. People said that at least the mother could be classed as sane. She had an extremely hysterical nature, however, and was without doubt the most meddlesome woman in the neighborhood, so much so that she was dissatisfied with her rationed allocations. When she was dissatisfied with her rationed allocations, she would rush out of the house barefoot to complain instantly to the town block association. The man's wife was an idiot. The man's wife was an idiot. Okay, the madman's wife was an idiot. One lucky year, he had undergone a religious awakening, clad himself in white, and set out on a pilgrimage to Shikoka. In the course of the trip, he had become friendly with a feeble-minded woman somewhere in Shikoka. He had brought her back as a sort of souvenir of his pilgrimage and had married her. Okay, So I should have put a question about the madman here. He's probably the third important, uh, most important character in the story. Um, he's a minor character, but still important. So uh, underline the madman and keep tabs, keep track of his characteristics and personality and so forth. And this paragraph that I just read is the uh, first uh, paragraph uh, in which the idiot woman, the feeble-minded feeble, feeble -minded woman, the Hakuchi, appears. So underline that and follow her uh, developments from this point forward. The madman was a handsome fellow. His feeble-minded wife had an elegance becoming a daughter of a good family. Her narrow-eyed, oval face had the prettiness of an old-fashioned doll or a no mask. Right, The oval face, the Urizanegao in Japanese, is a sort of... A, a, archetypal, uh, beautiful face in the Japanese tradition. Old-fashioned all in no mask. Outwardly, the two were not only good-looking, but appeared to be a well-matched couple of considerable breeding. The madman was extremely short-sighted and wore strong spectacles. As a rule, he had a pensive air, as though tired from reading innumerable books. One day, when an air raid drill was being held in the alley and the housewives were all bustling about efficiently, the madman had stood there in his, his everyday kimono, giggling inanely as he observed the scene. Then he had suddenly left and reappeared wearing an air raid uniform. Grabbing a bucket from someone, he had started to draw water and to throw it about the place, uttering various curious exclamations on the, all the while. After that, he placed a ladder against the wall, climbed to the top, and began shouting orders from the roof, ending in a stirring, admonitory speech. 
This was the first time that Izawa had actually realized that the man was mad. He had, it is true, already noticed certain eccentricities in his neighbor. For instance, the man would occasionally break through the fence into the tailor's garden and empty a bucket of leftovers into the pig pen. After this, he would suddenly throw a stone at the duck or, with an air of perfect nonchalance, start feeding the hen and then abruptly give her a kick. But on the whole, Izawa had taken the man to the compost mentis, mentis, and he used to exchange silent greetings with him when they happened to meet. What was the real difference, he wondered, between the madman and normal people? Sanity and uh, insanity, right? It's another uh, important binary that appears in this work. Uh, add that to your list. What is the difference between the madman and normal people? The difference, if any, was that the madman was essentially more discreet. To be sure, he giggled when he wanted to, gave a speech when he felt like it, threw stones at the duck, and would spend a couple of hours poking the pig's head and rear if the spirit so moved him. Head and rear if the spirit so moved him. Nevertheless, he was essentially far more apprehensive of public opinion than normal people, and he took special care in trying to isolate the main part of his private life from others. This was another reason that he had placed the entrance to his house on exactly the opposite side from the gate. On the whole, the madman's private life was devoid of noise. He did not go out, he did not go in for useless chatting, and he lived in a meditative way. On the opposite side of the alley was an apartment from which the sound of running water and of vulgar female voices constantly encroached upon Izawa's hut. The apartment was occupied by two sisters who were prostitutes. On nights when the elder sister had a customer, the younger one would pace the corridor. When the younger sister had a customer, the elder one would walk up and down deep into the night. And people considered the madman to be of a different way, race, thought Izawa merely because he was in the habit of giggling. So we have some interior monologue uh, employed there in that paragraph where the narrator jumps right into the mind of Izawa and uh, transcribes his thoughts uh, directly to us. <clears throat> the madman's feeble-minded wife was a remarkably quiet and gentle woman. So we, here we have more description about the hakchi, the... Um, Feeble-minded woman, so write um, her uh, characteristics down on your study guide as you listen to this part. Her speech consisted of a timid mumble. Even when one could make out the words, her meaning was uh, usually obscure. She did not know how to prepare a meal or boil rice. She might have been able to cook as she had had to, but as soon as she made a mistake and was scolded, she became so nervous that she began to spill and drop everything. Even when she went to get rations, she could do nothing herself. She merely stood there and let the neighbors manage for her. People said that since she was the wife of a madman, it was quite appropriate that she should be an idiot, and that the man's family could hardly expect anything better. The mother, however, was greatly dissatisfied and was constantly complaining about the misfortune of having a daughter-in-law who could not even boil rice. As a rule, she was a modest and refined old woman, but owing to her hysteria, she could become even fiercer than her mad son once she had been aroused. Among the three unbalanced occupants of the house, it was the old mother who uttered the loudest screams. The idiot wife was so intimidated by this that she was in a perpetual state of nerves, even on peaceful days when nothing had gone wrong. The mere sound of footsteps would fill her with alarm. When Izawa greeted her on the street, she would stand there petrified, with a vacant look on her face. The wife, too, occasionally came to the tailor's pig pen. Whereas the husband broke in openly, as if the house belonged to him, and threw stones at the duck or poked the pig's jowls, the feeble-minded woman slipped in silently like a shadow and hid behind the pig pen. In a way, this had become her sanctuary. 
After she had been there for a while, the old woman's croaking voice would usually come from the next door, shouting, Osayo, Osayo, and the idiot's body would react to each call by crouching further in the corner or by bending over. Before reluctantly emerging from her hiding place, the wife would time after time repeat her impotent, worm-like movements of resistance. Izawa's occupations of newspaper reporter and educational film director were the meanest of the mean. The only thing such people seemed to understand was the current fashion, and their lives consisted of a constant effort not to be left behind by the times. In this world, there were, was no room for personality, or the pursuit of the ego, or originality. All right, so in this passage, we kind of hear Sakaguchi Ango's own voice coming to the fore and giving his commentary on the uh, contemporary society and its state of uh, degradation and criticisms of it. All right, so this uh, narrator and Sakaguchi Ango himself kind of fuse together in this, in this section. In this world of originality, like office workers, civil servants, or school teachers, their daily conversations abounded with such words as ego, mankind, personality, originality, but this was all mere verbiage. What they meant by human suffering was more was some such nonsense as the discomfort of a hangover after a drunken night during which one had spent all one's money trying to seduce a woman. There should be no quotation mark there. Let me fix that. What they meant by human suffering was some such nonsense as the discomfort of a hangover after Duncan Nagar to try to slice a woman. They absorbed themselves in making films or writing fanciful pieces of colored prose, which had neither spiritual value nor any element of real feeling, but made ample use of such cliches as, ah, how inspiring the sight of the rising sun flag. All our thanks to you, brave soldiers. Despite oneself, the hot tears well up. The thud thud of bombs. Frantically, one hurls oneself to the ground. The chattering of machine gun fire. And they firmly believe that with this kind of drivel, they were actually portraying war. Some say they could not write because of military censorship, but the fact was that, war or no war, they had not the slightest idea how to write honestly of, on any subject. Truth or real feeling in writing has nothing to do with censorship. So here we have another dichotomy or a binary between truth and sincerity versus um, lies and insincerity and so forth. And obviously uh, for Sakaguchi Ango's narrator and for Sakaguchi himself, truth and sincerity uh, take the uh, priority over uh, insincerity and and duplicitousness and so forth. In whatever period those these gentry had happened to live, their personalities would surely have displayed the same emptiness. They changed in accordance with the prevailing fashion and took for their models expressions culled from popular novels of the day. So he's criticizing the entire zeitgeist of the time here and saying everybody merely conforms to the zeitgeist and nobody thinks for themselves and so forth. To be sure, the period itself was both crude and senseless. What relationship could there be between human honesty and the cataclysm of war and defeat in which Japan's 2,000-year-old history was being submerged? The entire fate of the nation was being decided by the will of those men who had the feeblest power of introspection and by the blind action of the ignorant mob that followed them. So the ignorant mob versus the uh, individual who actually is capable of introspection and of meditation and contemplation and so forth. There's another binary, write that down. If you spoke about personality and originality in front of the city editor or the president, he would turn away as if to say that you were a fool. After all, a newspaper reporter was nearly a machine whose function it was to spout forth all our thanks to you, brave soldiers. Ah, how inspiring the sight of the rising sun flag. Despite oneself, the hot tears well up. And so indeed was the entire period. It was all a mere machine. If you ask whether it was really necessary to give a full report of the speech by the divisional commander to his men, 
or whether you had to record every word of the weird Shinto prayer that the factory workers were obliged to recite each morning, the city editor would look away and click his tongue with annoyance. Then he would suddenly turn round, crush his precious cigarette in the ashtray, and, glaring at you, shout, Look here, what does beauty mean at a time like this? Art is powerless. Only news is real. Okay, so art versus uh, current events and, and uh, news and war and uh, contemporary reality is another binary that appears in this work. The directors, the members of the planning department, and the other groups had banded together to constitute their own private cabals, rather like the professional gambling societies of the Tokugawa period. Everything was based on group comradeship, and the individual talents of these members was, were used on a rotational basis with special emphasis on the traditional precepts of duty and human feeling. Giri Ninjo, right, in the original. The entire organization became more bureaucratic than the bureaucracy itself. Thus, they managed to protect their relatives, their respective mediocracies, and to form a sort of mutual aid relief organization founded on a homeless dearth of talent, any attempt to work one's way up by means of artistic individuality, so this, this has positive valence, artistic individuality, versus the uh, mob mentality of the herd, was regarded as a wicked violation of union rules. So it's me against the whole world here in this story. Internally, the groups were relief organizations for the dearth of talent, but in their relations to the outside world, they were alcohol-acquiring gangs whose members occupied the people's bars and argued drunkenly about art as they swilled their bottles of beer. Their berets, their long hair, their ties, and their blouses were those of artists, but in their souls they were mere, they were more bureaucratic than the bureaucrats. Bureaucrats, of course, has negative valence in his works. Since Izawa believed in artistic creativeness and in individuality, he found it hard to breathe in the atmosphere of these cabals. Their mediocrity, their vulgar and sordid spirit, was sheer anathema. He became an outcast. No one returned his greetings, and some in the office even glared at him when he made his appearance. All right, so um, I should say a word here about the eye novel. This might be read as an eye novel, even though it's not uh, writing... It's not telling the story from Sakaguchi's own experience directly. He created this sort of alter ego of Izawa and is telling the story about his alter ego, Izawa. There's still uh, some technical uh, um, features that resemble the I, I novel, namely um, this fusion of the narrator and the main character. Right, The narrator is a third-person narrator who's supposedly telling the story from a distant perspective, but his sort of uh, mental, his worldview and his perspective uh, throughout most of the story is so close to that of uh, Izawa that they kind of blend into one another. And this is, of course, one of the main hallmarks of the I novel: this blending of perspectives of the narrator and the main, the central protagonist. Right, this fusion of the two into a kind of single voice, a single uh, view point. One day, Izawa strode resolutely into the president's office and asked whether there was any inevitable logical link between the war and the current poverty of artistic output. Or was this poverty, he asked, the deliberate aim of the military, who insisted that all one need to, needed to portray reality was a camera and a couple of fingers? Surely, said Izawa, the special duty of us artists is to decide on the particular angle from which we should portray re reality so as to pursue, produce a work of art. While Izawa was still talking, the president turned aside and puffed at his cigarette with a look of disgust. Then he smiled sardonically as if to say, Why don't you leave our company if you don't like it here? Is it because you're afraid of being drafted for hard labor? Gradually, his expression changed to one of annoyance. Why can't you fit in with your way of working, he seemed to say. Just do your routine, your daily stint like the other man, and you'll collect your salary all the same. And stop thinking about what doesn't concern you, damned impertinence. Without a single word in reply to Izawa's questions, the president motioned for him to leave the room. How could this job of his be anything but the meanest of the mean? Sometimes he felt that it would be best to be done with it all and to be called into the army. If only he could escape from the anguish of thinking, even bullets and starvation might seem a blessing. 